Hey, so we're going to talk about a, a kind of cool topic. is the transformation of the mind. Last week, two weeks ago, last session, we talked about transformation in general. Well, what does it mean to be formed? What does it mean to be transformed? And we're going to talk about how God transforms, starting with our mind and our thoughts. So, let's just have, in a, in a very general conversation topic, what are some things that people's minds usually occupied with? Just in general, what are some things that people's minds usually occupied with? Worry. Worry, okay, what else? Money. Money? Yeah. No one else? Their kids. Their kids, yeah, definitely. My, uh, my, my youngest, my oldest daughter is going away to, uh, Camp by herself for the first time ever. Oh, yeah, something we're, we're taking her on Sunday. So we had an overnight camp. A whole week camp. Where am I? Delta Lake. Oh, Delta Lake. Oh, good. Yeah. She'll love it when she adjusts to it. Well, she will. Yeah, she's she's, yes. she's seven, so uh, she's mature though. Yeah. All right. So what are what are some of the things that we that we usually generally think of? Health issues. Health issues. Right. Yeah. Uh, de 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 depending. Uh, or you, well, you may also think about the weather, right? You may think about your job. Uh, you may think about this life. You may think about your TV show. You may think about sports. The, the reality is, okay, the mind is very powerful. The mind is always on, right? There's no, it's not like you can take a TV, you unplug it, or a computer, you shut down, right? You can't take a plug and unplug your mind. Even when we sleep, right, there are still things on our mind. Right? Sometimes you dream about stuff. All right? Who, who's ever dreamt about like their job or work? Right? It happens to everybody. Yeah. So your mind is something that is always constantly moving, constantly on. But the Bible talks a lot about how we need to operate with our mind, how we operate in our thought process, and the mind is very critical to our formation process because it's the entry point to everything else in our life. So a question I want to pose to us is this: I want you to write down. What are three thoughts that have occupied your mind this week? You should be on your first page there. Write them down. What are three thoughts that have occupied your mind this week? Go ahead and write that down on your sheet. Anybody want to share one or two or three of the thoughts that occupied your mind this week? Just generally, God's grace and faithfulness 
forgiven him for all the time. He never failed. Yep. And, and oftentimes, right, I think sometimes God put things in our mind to prepare us, right, for what's going to happen. Any, any other thoughts on what your mind is weak? What are they and why? My yeah. daughter was working in Queens, and I don't think she was uh, visiting people and various projects and things. I don't think she realized before she went how dangerous a place it was. Queens? Yes, but yeah. she sure realized that after she got there. Wow. So she, she was safe there for, for three days, right? Mm -hmm. So we're very thankful because that occupied her heart and mind. Is that Christy? No, my older daughter. She's a nurse practitioner. Oh, was she the one that was, uh, was in my class for a little bit? Yeah. Oh, the dog? Yeah. But you know, when you see a nurse on the street, she has potential to have drugs with her. Yeah. You know, paraphernalia, mm -hmm. drug paraphernalia. You know, so I thought, oh, she's a giveaway, you know? Yeah. Walking down the street, she's tall and blind, she stands out with a cute dog. Yeah. So, I was a little scary for her. It's good to sometimes examine, right? If we want, if we want to be people who really put our mind at focus, right, in, in order to be transformed by God, how often do we, how often do we just stop and think? What have I been thinking about? I, I, I think many of us probably don't do it enough, or some may not do it at all. It's, it's good to just pause, okay, and think. All right, what are some things that have been occupying my mind, both good and bad, okay? If, if, it's, if it's bad, right, why am I there? What in my heart is putting me in that mode? If it's good, what is God trying to tell me, right, through my thought life? Either or, it requires examination. Whether if it's, the, if it's the stuff of God to say, all right, God, what are you doing with this? What is this? Or if it's bad, it's saying, where do I need to get to in my devotional life, my, my heart, to make sure my mind does not go there? If you have your Bible, I want you to open up with me in Matthew chapter 6, please. Matthew chapter 6. We get verse 25 to 34 of Matthew 6. Twenty-five to thirty-four. If you don't have a Bible, you can follow along. If you have a Bible, uh, follow along with your Bible. These, these are the words of Jesus. This is what He says. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor weep nor gather into barns, and yet. You know, your Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they are? Verse 27. And which you are being anxious can add a single hour of the span of life. And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lose of the field. How they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Verse 30. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which stays alive and tomorrow is thrown in the oven, Will he not be much more? Will he not much more clothe you, O oh, you of little faith? Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, "What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear?" For the Gentiles seek after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But what? This is the key verse, verse thirty-three. Is, but what? Seek first the kingdom of God yes. and His righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore. You're going to be anxious for tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. That's what the ESV. So, what is Jesus telling us about our daily thought life? Don't, get over, don't let it overwhelm you and get to the point where you worry about it, it drives you crazy, yeah. and you act irrational. Yep. Exactly. And you could sit on You could sit about it, too. Yeah. You can sit a lot about, about it. A lot. Yeah. Because maybe you want to get out of a financial mess. Yeah. So you might say, well, if I do this, shave the books a little bit, cheat a little here, right. I can cover right. my tracks. Or right. if you're going to try to cover our own sin, we're going to sit about it. 
Yeah. Instead of asking the Lord, show me the way to get out of this mess. Yeah. Yeah. Whatever. That's a good point. Yeah. Or, or you know, I, if you're so much on money, you think about, oh, yeah. uh, what if I don't tithe this month? I can pay right, off. Right, I can right, pay right, off whatever. Right. You know. Or in Matthew chapter six. So, what else is this saying about our thought life and our and our mind?
the lack of a welfare mentality because you have to be responsible too yes. for, I mean, you're still, God will provide, but you're still to work. That's still got to work, yes. You know, and, you're, and Melanie still has to get those kids ready to do whatever they've got to do. Yeah. You still have responsibility. Yeah. So how do you get out of that? So don't worry about it, but you still have to have concern. You know, you still have to. Well, you have responsibility, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, I think, what do you talk about? Don't get frantic about it. Don't get frantic about it, yeah. Be yeah. educated about it. You have to know how you, you handle finances for the yeah. church. You yeah. have to know how to handle yeah. finances. Correct. Or it's not going to fall into place. Yeah. So, the trick is not to get consumed by it. Just relax. Yeah. I didn't use it. the word the trick. But and then, you know, you know, you look, look at the whole Bible, right? When you look at the Bible in whole, God created us to work, right? Yes. He created us to work, right? And then rest, right? Work and rest, right? See, we, we Sabbath is key. We need a Sabbath, we need a day to connect with God, right? But the other half of that is we have to work, right? God created us to work, to want to work. Right? That, that's why those of you who are retired, you're still busy, right? Because it's who you are, who God created you to be. Good discussion. Hey, Romans 12. If you could, you could turn to it, please. This is a, uh, when, when I talk about transforming the mind, this is a, I would say, popular passage. A good passage to underline, to memorize, to remember. So many, many of you probably already know this passage by heart. Somebody want to read this passage, Romans 12, 2 in the Bible? Yep, Tony. 12, 2. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may be proved that is what is what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Mm. Wow. What a jam packed verse. You know, you can do sermons, whole classes from this one verse. Alright, what is what does the Bible here tell us about our mind? It's easily influenced. It's easily influenced by outside influences. Because we have a free will, that, that could be our worst enemy. Yep. And we could, uh, if we could get, get, get God out of the picture in our daily lives, we're in trouble. Yeah. Because we'll, our mind will wander. And you can feel I can do it on my own. I got enough money, or I got enough power, I got enough. Yeah. Uh, Common sense, yeah. no. The yeah. Satan's going to get you sooner or later. You'll break your bones. Yeah. This is almost a command too. Mm. Stop being conformed. Yeah. Be transformed. Well, it yep. says here, I beseech thee, he's begging yeah. you, like. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Remember, he says, therefore, it's down I've taken you out of the world and put you back in the world. Don't be love the world. Correct. Yeah. So, what is what is, what is what does this verse say happens when we're transformed by our mind? Whoa. Crazy, right? Yeah. How awesome is that? That you may test and discern what, what God's will is, right? What He wants me to do, where He wants me to go, how He wants me to serve Him. You see, change, right? True life change comes from our heart and comes from our soul, right? But that start with our mind. mind. We transform by the mind, right? And then it, it affects our actions and our thoughts and our feelings, and then it's out of our heart. That we are changed. The thought life and feelings, aka the mind, is the first place of our now spirit sustained and spirit directed efforts to internal transformation. What that's saying is this that the first place you need to start when you want to be transformed, when you want the spirit to transform you and mold you, is the thought life, the mind. Your thought and feelings. Turn to page two of your notes, please. Page two of your notes. So, what is it? What are some of the different realms of thought? I'm, I'm going to go over some of the different aspects of thought and the mind, and, oh, and and see how they affect us on a spiritual matter. Got this nice, nice neat uh, head here, and a lot of uh, bells and whistles goes in our head. And I'm going to give you the four realms of thought, and then uh, there's no space on your page to write them in, but then we're going to dive 
into them and go a little deeper on what each one means. So here are the four realms of thought. Number one is our ideas. Number one is ideas. And we're going to go detail each one of them. Number two, images. So your ideas, your images. Then you have three, information. And then you have four, the ability to think. So we have ideas, images, information, and ability to think. Number one, ideas. What are ideas? Ideas, they're general models of or assumptions of reality. Right? It's, what we, it's like what we believe and think of something. They're patterns of interpretation. And these are things that are culturally developed, historically developed, or socially shared. They're beliefs, ways of thinking, ways of interpreting things. Some, some, some examples of ideas are <coughs> happiness. Right. How you were brought up may determine your idea of happiness. <coughs> your faith in Jesus may determine your idea of happiness. There's freedom, <coughs> education, right? Ideas are never people de definition, but you know people are always trying to control them. Well, what, what's hard for some of us for our ideas is sometimes people try to control their ideas and they, they allow their own ideas to govern their life. Open up your Bible with me to Ephesians 6.12, please. Ephesians 6.12. So there's a struggle, right, with what we think and what we believe about something. Right? The struggle is not against flesh and blood, but what? Against the rulers and authorities of this world. So, so a lot of times, right, the enemy tries to give you the idea that the problem is your brother and sister in Christ, right? But the problem is actually Satan, not the brothers in Christ. See, a lot of times, right, the enemy tries to throw us off his attacks by making think, have an idea and a thinking and a belief that our issue and our conflict is with so-and-so. A lot of times, right, it's a spiritual battle. Turn to Philippians 2.5, please. The Philippians 2 5. Our, our ideas shape how we think, how we interpret things. And if we're not careful, those ideas can try to control us if we're not in the right mindset. What does Philippians 2 5 say? Somebody? What's it saying about our mind? It needs to be what? Like Jesus Christ. It, my verse is in your relations with one another, right? Have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. See, we, we read Ephesians 6 12. It says, hey, your battles, your struggles, okay? They're not against flesh and blood, right? So, so when, when I'm having an issue, a conflict, a strife, okay? There is a not all the time, but most of the time, there's a spiritual attack, right? Because Jesus says that my, my desire that the world is one. My desire is that the world is unified, that you love one another. And Satan comes in and gives us ideas that are bad with flesh and blood, but it's actually against spiritual darkness. And what Philippians 2 5 says is this In your relationship with one another, when you interact with each other, you need to have the same mind set as Christ. 
same mindset as Christ. So that one, that my ideas of how things need to proceed is like Christ. The second aspect, it's a big one. Images. Images. What are images? They, as opposed to ideas, where ideas are sort of abstract, images are concrete. See, ideas are abstract, they're thoughts, beliefs, interpretation of things, but images are, ab, are, are concrete, they're specific. And what images do is, they are heavily connected to feeling. Images are heavily connected to feeling. Let me give you an example. My wife grew up um, out in Schoharie County in Carlisle, New York. Anybody know where Carlisle, New York is? It's a small town, right? Huh? Route 20. Route 20, yep. Uh, we call it Covis Hill because no one knows where Carlisle is. But uh, uh, growing up, they, they, they're, they're, there used to be many little uh, ice cream stands. I'm from the West Coast. Uh, I've, I've never I had no idea what an ice cream stand was until I came out east here. Um, and how, why there's a big deal, you know. So when I married my wife, right, and I'd have to grab my ice cream stand in the summer, she so wanted to stop by it. These little mom and pop ice cream stands, you know, and around town here. And and I, I said, what's so big with these ice cream stands? We can go to like any other ice cream place. And for her, it was the nostalgia, right, of, of the childhood of going with her family. Enjoying the summer, right? And for her, seeing those, it still to this day, right, has an the image has a connected feeling to it. Images connect to our feelings. See, there's a powerful emotional impact in how we think. Image equals meaning, right? In culture, right? When our, in our cultural society, image equals meaning, right? Like, depending what culture, right? Hair, right? How you wear your hair, how you wear your clothes, right? In different cultures, right, that has specific meaning. If you think about churches, right? Usually, a church building type has a meaning, right? And if you, if you go to a church that's, used to, that, that's at a shopping center, right? Your meaning, interpretation of what that is, is different than you go to a church that was built in 1855, right? You're going to expect different things. You, you go to a church that has one type of instrument and a different, right? You associate meaning with that instrument, right? If you go to a church and all you see are giant pipe organs, right? Your image of that is connected to a meaning in your heart. You go to a church and all you see are electric guitars and drums, right? That has a meaning. What kind of meaning can it be? Huh? We're in the jungle. We're in the jungle? How so? Well, we're beating down the drums. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, we're in the jungle. We're in the jungle, I guess. America's going so downhill. I heard a story about this kid. Yeah. Coming home to his parents and he said, Oh, I don't know what to do. And the kid says to the parents, Mom, why do all the buildings have plus signs on them? You know, how do you tell the kid that that's the church and it's across the Lord? Mm. When, when you're going so far, the kid thinks it's a plus on that. So mm. nobody, nobody, no, nobody knows that. that. Nobody knows that. that good transition, actually. That's, that's my next point. Okay. But, that's great. You, you, for some reason, we're always on this detective wave, by the way. We, we, yeah. every, every, every time we do that. That's dangerous with that. Yeah. yeah so, trouble, you, you think about Jesus' yeah. mission, right? He was. To the to image, the image of the cross, right? That that everything is on, on the cross. That that the time he will come when he will uh, be on the cross, sacrifice himself for us. And after that, right, the Apostle Paul, all Paul's writings, right? You cannot read anything that Paul writes without hearing about the cross. Paul says, "I want to, you know, preach Christ and preach Christ crucified." Why? It's that image of the cross, the image that that. That it's set to our meaning that we have, we, we picture Jesus on the cross, and hopefully, right, that meaning impacts us. That hey, my sin is on the cross. Jesus died for me. Meaning connects to images. 
this is a very powerful way in how we transform internally, but also a dangerous way in how we can spray. Third aspect, information. So we have ideas, images, information. Hey, question. What happens, how do you feel, when you do not have the information you need? When you are lacking information, okay, go ahead, what? Frustrated. Why are you frustrated? Because you, you know you're supposed to do something about something if you don't have all the information you need. That's good. Is that good? Yeah, anyone else? But it's like uh, you want to go someplace, you don't have, a, have to go there. Yeah. You feel, now what do I do? Correct. Right? You feel helpless. You don't understand it. You don't understand what it's about if you haven't got the information. Yeah, like if I give you a, a, a task to do, right? And I give yeah. you no instructions and say, I want this task done and you got to do it this way, you would get frustrated, right? Lack of information results in everything from unpleasant rage to, to any type of emotion across human life. Whatever you can think of, of unpleasantries, lack of information hurts us. It, it causes us to react. Right? If, if, for, for, for us, right, if we lack information in certain areas, we get frustrated. frustrated. And what, what happens when we get frustrated? Angry. Angry. Right? And then, then what happens to our mind when that happens? Consumed with what? Anger, frustration. And all we're thinking about Strongholds. is... Strongholds. Huh? Strongholds. Strongholds, yeah. Go to uh, Hosea. Old Testament, for those of you who need to find it. <coughs> Hosea is after Daniel before Joel. Jesus 
had a mission. Luke chapter 4. Luke 4, 18. Luke 4, 18. I, I love that this is Jesus' quote of the Old Testament, but this is also Jesus' mission, right, on earth, that he was gonna, that he wanted to tell people what was going on. So Luke chapter 4, verse 18, can I have a volunteer read that, please? Because the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, he sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim uh, liberty to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set of liberty to those who are oppressed, to proclaim the so what was the first task the Spirit of God told him to do? Is to what? To preach. To proclaim. Right? To proclaim the good news. To preach the good news. Why? Because... So he's giving them the information. Information. He wants to give them the information. Right? The first thing he said was to proclaim the good news. To preach the good news. Because lack of information right, causes ruin. It causes disjointness. It causes uneasiness. Division. Division, right? You need the information, right, to process it, to live, to be transformed. Jesus, that was his mission. I'm, I'm going to go to the temple as a little boy and talk to you about what God's word said. I'm going to be on a, on a boat and I'm going to preach to you. I'm going to, I'm going to go to the hills and, and talk to you. I'm going to go to the house and heal you. Jesus was about... Proclaiming, preaching, giving people the information, right, to make decisions. See, Jesus was saying, here, this is what God says, this is what the Bible says. Now you need to make the choices for yourself. So, the fourth realm of thought is this. The ability to think. The ability to think. Why do you think this is important? The ability to think. Yeah. All those three steps lead up to the fourth step, which is the ability to do with your free will the right thing or the wrong thing. Yeah. Isn't it great that God gives us free will? Choose this day whom you will serve. Yep. God gives us free will. Yeah. Right? God's God, God, not a puppet master, not controlling the screen. He gives us free will. Free will to love Him or free will to not love Him. And He gives us all the information to how to know Him yep. and the consequences of not accepting Him. He gives us that the whole picture. Yep. Romans, Romans uh, 1, 18, right, about the wrath of God. It's like saying, hey, Romans 1, 18 to like 22 says this, that mankind is without excuse. That God has made himself known. God has revealed himself through nature, through the creation. God has given himself to people, right? So mankind is not escaped from God's wrath. People can't say, hey, God, I didn't know you were existing. God's, what Romans 1 says is, I'm everywhere. I, I, I'm, I'm telling you who I am. I'm proclaiming who I am. And it's your job to do something with it. So the ability thing is to process all of that. It's searching out what is true, what cannot be true. It's taking the facts and the assumptions and figuring out what is real. It takes the information that we have and have to see the larger picture. To see it whole. To see it clearly. And the ability to think also takes things that are false images, push that aside. It takes things that are misleading ideas and to squash that. It, th it takes things that are false and it allows God's power to speak in truth to us. It's a powerful gift that we have, the ability to think, the free will, to allow ourselves to take the images and the ideas and information for ourselves or allow God to work through that. And so what we need to do is when we read the Word of God and read the Bible, we must apply our thinking to God's Word. Right? So we take God's Word, right? We need to process it, and it's the ability to think. How do I take what I just read and dwell upon it, right? How do I ponder upon it? What what does it mean? What, what, what is the implications? What are the applications? Is it a warning? Is it a promise? Exactly, right? And this stuff relates to our lives. The question is, what do we do in light of the facts of the gospel that we read? What do we do in the light of the revelation of God that, that's in the Bible? See, these are things that, that we need to do in order to be transformed. 
how are we to think about things determines how we're changed, right, from the inside out. Remember the little WWJD bracelets? Yeah. What would Jesus do? Yeah. Right? Thinking like that. Hebrews 2.1 is a good verse about paying attention. It says this, 2.1, we must pay the most careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard, so that we not drift away. So when you hear God's word, it's the ability to think. So, to recap, right, our thought process starts with ideas. Ideas that maybe culture has given us, ideas that we're, we've grown up with, ideas that are that we brought with our families, right? And ideas can be good and bad. These are things that, that are abstract beliefs, things how we want to interpret things. But when we have it with images, images are concrete things that we can see and picture. And But you know what, though? Because we can see and picture that, those images are connected to feeling. The other aspect is information. That we have information that comes in our mind that we need to process and we need to do with. And with that is the ability to think, right? How are we to think with what we are able to do? Our first and most basic freedom, from which all else derives, is the freedom to choose what we will think of and what we will have before our mind. Think about that. Our first and most basic freedom, right? From everything else derives is this. The freedom to choose what we will think of and what we will have before our mind. Think about Adam and Eve, God gave them this beautiful paradise, right? You guys run this world. You, you take care of my plants. You take care of my animals. You, you are stewards of my creation, right? This, this is what I've given you. Just don't, don't do that and think that. Just one little thing. One little thing, right? Oh, Satan, Satan got them. Satan got them to think. He got Adam and Eve to have their mind off of the beauty, right? and put their mind on something that was deadly. Think about it. 99.9% .9 of the world was theirs. Nine, like almost everything. If God gives me less than 1%, that's more than enough for me, right? That's more than I deserve. Right? He gave them he gave everything to, to, to rule and to have dominion over, right? But Satan got a hold of their mind, had their mind focused on a one little tree and they were focused on that, right? Took it and sent it into the world. And, and before, they were not thinking about hiding from God, but as soon as they sinned, what did they think about? Yeah. I'm naked. I'm ashamed. I gotta hide. That thought never entered their mind before they sinned. That thought of being away from God, of hiding from God, of, of, of being naked before God, being exposed to God. That was never in their thought process until they decided to choose what they will think of. See, our most basic freedom is a freedom to choose what we will think of and what we will have before our mind. There was a, there was a, a scholar named Frank Laubach. He was a missionary in the Philippines. He also was a, a, a theologian. And he wrote uh, kind of processes on what it means to be transformed. He, he, he was alive, I don't know, in the 40s, I think, the 30s and 40s. And this is his work on transformation. I think it applies to our mind and how we think. His first step is this. The first step is submission to the will of God means cooperation with God in the moment-to-moment -moment activities that make up our daily existence. So the first thing is, is we got to submit. You have to submit to the will of God and be in conjunction with God in everything we do. This cooperation is achieved through continuous inner conversation with God, right? That's prayer, being the scripture, talking to God, right? The only way we can make God the forefront, remember we read Matthew 6? Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God, right? And we're saying the only way we can do that if we're continuously in conversation with God, because what happens if we're not? We lose sight of God's kingdom. Through that conversation, in turn, is in turn from our side a matter of keeping God constantly before the mind. 
right? Matthew 6, Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God. One we learn to keep God constantly in mind by experimentation, by trying various experimental devices, and to the habit of constant God thought established. So what he's saying is this, hey, you gotta try different things, right? We're all made different. We're all created different. Well, okay, well, it works for me. It doesn't work for you, right? You don't know that. Well, how you connect with God needs to be through experimenting, right? If, if, if something doesn't work for you, try something else. Keep trying because the reality is God wants to connect with us. And too many times people try one mode and it doesn't work and they don't, they don't, they don't connect well and they stop and they're done. The reality is there are so many ways that God allows us to connect with him and they keep trying. Number five, then God permeates itself and transforms its world and its relations to others into God's field of constant action in which all the promises of Christ's gospel are realized in abundance of life. And six, it is possible for all people under all conditions to establish this habit and to make constant effort and experiment with particular circumstances to discover how it can be done. So, in his study, what he's saying is this. All people, right, it's a matter of young, old, right, educated, not educated, all conditions, you can experience a habit of being constantly putting God at the forefront. You're constantly reshaping, reforming, and figuring out how you need to transform your mind. Page three of your notes. Three step, three step process on how to transform your mind. Is this. Three step process you have in your notes, page three. Vision, intention, means. Vision, intention, means. Vision, intention, means. What do you think I, what do you think I, what do you think I mean by when I say vision? As your, as, your, as your first step. Where do you want to be? Where do you want to be? But more important, where does God want you to be, right? That's your vision, right? What does God have for me? What does God want me to think? How does God want me to act? How does God want me to, to believe and to view? What about attention? Glorify God. Right? Yeah. Your intention is to glorify Him. Close, yeah. Do I want to obey God? Yeah, do I want to obey God? Intention is, hey, I have God's vision, what do I want me to do? Uh, focus on what I'm doing. Do I want to do it? Yeah. Right? Um, Submitting your will. Yeah. Right? See, spiritual discipline, connected with God, is an easy process, yet it's so hard for many of us to do. Right? It, it, to, to, to get to God is the easiest thing. God makes it so easy for us to connect with Him, right? Jesus' yeah. death on the cross. Right? for our sins, gives us that access that we have anytime we want to God. Right. It's one of the easiest things that we have, easiest paths we have, yet so few take it. Why? It's the intention. Right? You have the vision, you know what you want to do, you know what God wants you to do. The intention is, right? am I going to do it? What about means? Prayer or supplication. Yeah, means. How does that look like? How am I going to do it? How am I going to do it, right? So if, if, if God wants me to do this, and I, and I, and I know I'm going to do it, I want to do it, but we got to get the means to get there, right? So, so let, let's say, let's talk about prayer, right? If, if God is saying, hey, I want you to be a person devoted to prayer, you know, much more than you are now, like an extra hour per day, right? Okay, so, so you get the attention for it. Well, yeah, I'm gonna, I want to do it, I want to do it, right? You know, you got to have the means. you got to have the time out, right? you got to have the space. See, transformation of the mind happens when we have vision, intention, and means. It's a three-step process because we can't go to the means if we don't have the vision. There's right? some people that think all that's automatic. It's not, yeah. yeah it's not really problem. some people that think they don't have to cooperate at all, that God just changes you and yeah. Correct. And there's a lot who think, hey, you know what? I don't need this. I'm just yeah. going to kind of uh, sit in church and soak everything right. in. I'm, I'm done. Yeah. Yeah. you got a purpose to to want to do right yeah. and, and follow his path, it's not our path, because we will, we're going to fall short. Yeah. M many of you, uh, either are small group leaders or have been small group leaders or will be small group leaders, 
And uh, what, what, you know, what I found out is the hardest step for a, a, an attendee is to join a small group to make that step. All right, I, 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 I have met so many people in, in church, not just here, but everywhere, elsewhere. Hey, you want to be a small group? Yeah, I, I really want to be a small group. I really want to be a small group. And it's always, you see, that first email, when they email the small group leader or email the pastor or the phone call that they want to do, that is the hardest step. It, it, is, it is like jumping over the Grand Canyon for them to, to do that. It, it is. And, and literally, it, it, it's easy as, hey, you know, um, just, just contact, contact Dick and you can be in this group. It's, it's that easy. But it's like this giant wall, right? Because it's, maybe the intentions aren't there. Right? And, and for a lot of people, it, it, they say they want to be in this small group. They, they know they should be in community. They know they should be connected. But just getting that, oh, it's so hard to do that for a lot of people. Vision, intention, and means. Hey, well, let me uh, read a quote here. It says this. Now it's what we're. Our thoughts are one of the most basic sources of our life. They determine the orientation of everything we do and invoke the feeling that frame our world and motivate our actions. Basics, our thoughts are basic, but you know what? Everything we do invokes the feelings of our world and motivate our actions. But what are some dangers in our thought? What are, things, what are some things we need to worry about and pay attention about? There are four things that we can uh, look at and be aware of in our thought life. Number one is this. Pride and overconfidence in ideas, images, or bits of information simply because they are ours or they're mine. <laughs> Doctrine. Practice. Commission. Say, hey, I grew up in the church this way. And you know what? That is how we need to do it. You're almost describing an unteachable spirit. Yeah. Right? Um, a danger of thought life is having success and making that success translate to everything else, everybody else. Right? If it worked for me 20 years ago, it should work for everyone else, and that's going to save. Or, or this is how we do it, right? This is how you need to do it. To do it right? That could be a danger of having an overconfidence and pride in our ideas and information. Number two, Simple ignorance of facts. It's not knowing the facts, not knowing the information. That could be that could be a thought. So, so something if we don't if we don't dive into the fact, don't we dive into the truth that we just assume, right? That's that that's that idea stage. If we just assume things, have our own idea about it, we can get in danger of our thought life. Number three, allowing our desires to guide our thinking, especially the desire to prove we are right. I'm going to admit it, I like being right, okay? My wife hates that I like to be right. She likes to be right too. And then uh, somehow I raised my daughter to want to be right too. So, it's, it gets kind of, kind of unique in our household. And uh, my oldest daughter is just like me. She just has to be right. All she has to get the last word in. So we're trying, trying to uh, watch myself and then help her as well. But, right, some of our desires to prove we are right can guide our thinking. Right? You can have your desire be wrong, that can impact your thinking. That makes sense? Where, hey, I believe something is so right, I believe something so true, that it's going to affect my thinking, and then my belief, and it gets all twisted. Number four, big one, right? Images that we admit in our mind. Right? That can go without saying that we live in a very visual culture, very image focused culture. And what we allow in our mind can either destroy us or bless us. It's like our mind is a big hard drive and the enemy can access it. Correct. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And so that's what we, so that's what we do with spam where just clean out our hard drive, right? Yeah. So that's what we need to put, put, a, uh, put filters in our hard drive. Right? But sometimes we need to have ways where our hard drive is basically refresh and clean. Images are very strong, right? Even the Bible talks a lot about that, right? Because I tell you, human, mankind has not changed for thousands of years. Images still have feelings that connect us in both positive 
and both negative ways. So here's what I want you to do. After sheet, I want you to answer two questions tonight. Write them down. Number one, what are some steps I can take to make sure that thought is rightly directed and used in the process of spiritual formation? Number one, what can you do to make sure that your thought life is directed in spiritual formation? And number two, what is one thing I will take away from tonight's class?